Oh, there it is. It's watch live liquid aeration Q and A with John Perry. That's you. I know that guy. I think we're I think we're live. Is anybody who's in the chat able to confirm that we're live and not uh, make news? I would like to confirm that we are live. A little orange light just came on on my screen. <laughs> okay, I, I will take the orange light. That's better than nothing. Hello to everybody that's watching and welcome to the first ever Picture Perfect live video. I'm really excited and a little nervous because anything could happen when you're live if watching late night TV has taught me anything. Um, we are going to be talking specifically about liquid aeration, but if you have questions about anything else, feel free to ask and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. I've got Brandon here, who is one of our owners at Picture Perfect and the head of our fertilization division. He has designed our program, visit every morning, and applies to property. And featured with us today is John Perry himself, the creator of Loncology, the YouTube channel, Instagram, and worldwide sensation. Oh, come on. As green and fertilizer, the next products, and most importantly for us today, the Liquid Air 8 product that we're going to be discussing because liquid aeration is taking the country by storm. Um, John, do you want to tell our viewers, whether they're professionals, DIYers, or picture perfect clients, a little bit about yourself? Well, I don't know if I can do better than what you just did. That was fantastic. Uh, yes. So um, I've been in this business for a number of years now, coming up on 20. Uh, started in the LNO side myself with my own company, began developing products very early on in that. Um, had uh, competitors looking and seeing what I was doing in lawn care and asking about it. And that's what led me to my first customers was selling the uh, creations that I was making which led into starting a uh, licensure of the product and the brand um, called BioGreen, BioGreen USA. And uh, that just sort of kept snowballing uh, into Green County Fertilizer and the next line and basically building everything off of soil amending nutritionals, always taking that soil first, uh, kind of filling the voids and gaps in uh, programs for people. And that's that's sort of the long and short of it. Well, that's awesome. Um, I know that your approach to focusing on the soil and getting the soil healthy to make the plant healthy, make the grass healthy has been something almost revolutionary in terms of changing a lot of viewpoints of applicators across the country and really trying to get away from artificial stimulation and into something more healthy and true and self-sustaining. Um, liquid aeration is something that Picture Perfect in the Richmond, Virginia area, for anybody who doesn't know, has been using kind of low key in our regular fertilizer program for the last two or three years mm -hmm. um, around late spring, just to kind of help loosen things up about halfway since we did the core aeration. And in our area, because we've kind of been dominated by companies that really, really tout the importance of core aeration, and you got to pull out those plugs and get seed to soil contact and everything, aeration is something that is very expected by all of the homeowners in our area. But that core aeration has really been dug in through aggressive marketing to be something that's expected. And there's some skepticism that comes with the liquid aeration approach as a result. So we've seen as we've incorporated Air 8 into our program for fertilizer that there's been a shift among other products contributing to it in terms of that soil health and root development and just an ability to stick something in the ground in the middle of the summer. Um, do you see, John, across the people that you work with in different parts of the country, it taking over for core aeration or do you see kind of a cohabitation between the two? I, you know, honestly, the best way to answer that is it depends on the business model is, is my best way to answer that. I would say that in general, once people have used the, the liquid aerate product, they get really excited about selling their aeration machines. Um, that's one thing that I have seen an awful lot of. I, I think an explanation is, is in order so that people really understand the difference. You know, what, one thing to think about in nature, okay? So when you, when you think about nature, you think about natural landscapes, you think about fields and grasslands, you, the compacted soil is not a conversation. Compacted soil comes from cultivated landscapes. And 
One thing that happens over time that we've seen via, you know, heavy fertilization, and I, I want to make sure that anybody who's watching this, you're not going to hear me say chemical fertilization or, or organic fertilization. I'm just going to say cultivated or, or heavily fertilized land. Nitrogen stimulates a lot of top growth, not a lot of root growth, and soils tend to get neglected. So when soils don't have carbon replenishment and they're not getting deeper roots and, and allowing water to flow, they get hard. That's just a natural response to over fertilization or even over cultivation. So when you think about aeration, you need to really think about it as air flow. It's not about poking holes. OK, so, you know, you can have a beach ball that's full of air. You poke holes in it. You no longer have air. OK, that's one thing. But if you look at the soil as it is, roots are what water and air travel down through. Roots of the plant. That is what's going to naturally aerate soil. So when we use this liquid aeration, and it's really the best term for it, is, is liquid aeration. There's a lot of oxygen and there's a chemical reaction in the soil that allows for greater penetration of the soil of nutrients and water flow, which allows it to open up. And that's where your aeration comes from. We're not moving soil from one place to another. We're not changing the composition of the soil. We're just allowing it to function better. That's awesome. And that's, that's what we think is cool about the product is instead of just kind of doing a patch with these huge macro pores to open up the porosity of the soil the way that a core does, we're actually breaking down and opening up little micro fissures to allow for much truer and systemic flow of nutrients and air and everything else. Um, one of the questions that I got from a picture perfect client, and he emailed me a week or two ago because he wasn't sure if he would make it for the live show tonight, um, had to do with seed to soil contact. Yes. Because one of the things that a lot of people, especially old school core aerators, have in mind is in order for seed to germinate, it has to have that direct contact and get that foothold with the soil. Do you see that being a factor? In our experience, we've seen seed grow on concrete. It always mm -hmm. grows on the sidewalk in the driveway. We've seen it grow in the bag. It just needs a little bit of moisture. Um, but do you see that being a conversation in terms of that liquid aeration? No, I do think that that is, that is a common belief. Um, but it, anybody who's done a science experiment with a seed in a paper towel would know that it's an inaccurate belief. Um, seed requires temperature and moisture. That's what it requires. It requires a certain temperature and it requires moisture for that seed casing to open. The root is going to seek out the soil. OK, so if you think about it, uh, who aerated the prairie lands? <laughs> Not a person. Right. So grass grew thick. Seed fell. It worked its way to the ground. It germinated every spring and and we kept getting replenishment without having somebody go across there with their spiky shoes on. And it worked just fine, right? And nature always has a way. You require moisture and you require the proper temperature. And if you don't have either of those, your seed won't grow. That, Like really, if it's too cold, you're not going to get germination. If it's too hot, you're going to kill the seed. Too much or too little water, you're not going to get what you're looking for. But the root will find the soil. That is nature's design. And we cannot make it any better with an aerator. So what I would what I would challenge a person to think about is this. If that's the only way that you think that seed can grow, is that the only place that seed grows after you seed? Absolutely not. It grows everywhere the seed was scattered. It does not just grow in the poked holes. So no, you don't require that. It just has to be covered, moist, correct temperature, you have seed. Perfect. And um, in, so a couple of weeks ago, we published the video on our channel. By the way, anybody who's watching at this point, if you haven't already, subscribe to the Picture Perfect channel and then go over and subscribe to the Oncology channel so you can hear more from John. But we did our liquid air, liquid aerate video that talked all about porosity and compaction. And I did some science experiments and it was entertaining, I hope. Um, and then a couple of days later, we did a video about liquid defatch, which is another product in John's arsenal that is awesome. And I'm a big fan of this because it's really cool to see it in action in yards that we apply it to. Um, basically, the idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but it's an enzymatic process that is encouraging the 
decomposition and breakdown of dead or dying organic material, namely the thatch layer that you see building up in turf. And all of that nutrition and organic compost is entering the soil system, big dump of all of those nice little nutrients and the lawn turns green and it's a great system. Um, do you see, John, a good pairing between applying liquid dethatch prior to seeding to encourage that seed to soil contact and everything else? I think it depends on what your cultural practices are leading up to that point. Um, you know, if you are, if you have had a, a heavy growth season, okay, so, so let's look at it this way. Cool season turf is not intended to grow fast during the summer. So theoretically, when you come into the fall, you should not have a buildup of, let's call it lawn litter. I'm going to, I'm going to call it that it's somewhat of an agricultural term. When, when uh, corn stalks are out in the field, they have litter in the field, they have stubble digester, they have all this kind of, so let's think about it like that. It's more like a, a stubble or a litter of the lawn that starts to build up. So for the most part, by the time you're coming out of summer, you shouldn't be seeing that. That should be getting down to next to nothing. Then beyond that, you should be able to use a combo if you need to, uh, if you have to break down any sort of extra material, it works well. But I would actually take that on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think that it needs to be widespread by any means. Um, what we've seen the most of, and I, I think that you guys can attest to this, is when the litter, the composition, the, the old grass blades start to break down, there is a release of nutrients in that material. So when you think about hay, uh, grass haze, and things like that, the feed test and the nutritional value happens after it's dry. That's when you actually get the value of that material. So the water is gone, the nutrients are left, and as it starts to digest, you actually do get a flush up, which is kind of like a green waste or green manure type feeding. And I think that's what a lot of people are seeing out of the, the dethatch itself. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely something that we've seen. Um, you've, you've seen that happen in terms of the property we had this spring where it grew like crazy and a lot of clippings got left behind. Do you want to tell everybody about that? Yeah, no, you don't really. But he does. He's ready. Look at him. <laughs> I mean, so we just had a lawn that we, um, it grew really fast this spring. We had a really wet and cool spring, and the grass started growing really fast, and we couldn't keep up mowing as well as we would have liked to because we had so much rain coming in. Um, and we actually had a few spots in the lawn that, almost died because there was so much grass on top of it and such a thick amount of thatch down the bottom on the soil. So I went through with a pretty heavy rate of the deep thatch and it cleaned up, I'd say 98% of it. Most of the grass came back. Um, it's probably one of the greenest lawns that we have now. Once it managed to actually really go in there, clean everything up and get rid of all that extra thatch and just help to break it down and go back down to the soil and let it start to, feed the grass that was left. It definitely, Excellent. It definitely makes a difference. It's, it's pretty cool how it works. Um, I'm starting to get finally some questions over here in the chat. That's what I'm pointing out right now is, is where I have the chat window. Um, for anybody who's watching, that's the whole point of this. It's not to just listen to me play Oprah and field some questions to Captain Reluctance and John. It's also for you guys to ask your own questions, no matter who you are, if you're a homeowner, if you're an applicator, if you're a picture perfect client, you're especially the one that I want to hear from. Um, but we want to hear what y'all's questions are because I can only think of so many off the top of my head. We want to know what you guys have. Um, I did see pop up just a second ago, not the couldn't brand and hold it till the end, but somebody asked how often or how at what interval, I guess, um, air rate should be applied prior to seeding. Do you see any? need for there to be a certain timing or can it just go down at once or yeah again I, I think it's really a case-by-case -case basis i think that people okay depending on who you are as as a professional applicator you have to time things with your applications you're out there every six or eight weeks whatever your schedule is you're gonna have to come up with a good time i love putting air aid out early in the spring and that again as we move into fall say in august before the overseeding time just to kind of help things open up and start moving um as a homeowner in you, if you're a diy person i mean the sky's the limit if you have compacted soil you can use it and you can use it in 
light amounts more often. You could do it once a year, whatever you thought was going to be the best mode. Uh, it, it's different, basically a different strokes for different folks. You have to work with what works best with your program. And there isn't a bad time. Okay. So in certain areas of the country, I have people apply air aid in the fall, like in Florida here, because it helps with in later on, typically they get fungus around October. A lot of that has to do with coming out of blackout times and feeding nitrogen heavy. And we want to keep the ground moving. And that makes a huge difference uh, for the amount of fungus that shows up later in the season. So that's a time. It's all timing. It's seasonal. It's weather related, but there isn't a bad time to do it. That's awesome. That I think that that's going to be a good thing for anybody, especially homeowners that are interested in applying it because they don't have to try to tweak their whole program to accommodate something if it's going to be that flexible. Mm -hmm. um, I've got somebody here. Uh, Jay is asking if Aerate is going to stain anything like sidewalks or the curb or anything like that. Is that something that you've experienced at all? First off, Jay, um, you cannot aerate your sidewalk or <laughs> your driveway. It's best to keep it on the grass. It is dark material. It is dark material. If you apply it when it's hot, you are likely to see it. Um, it is not technically a staining material. There's no iron, there's no metals, there's nothing like that in it, but it is dark and it is very micro, I mean, I'm going to say microscopic or micronized, let's make up a word. Um, it's just small, small, small particles meant to penetrate soil surfaces. So if it gets into cracks, you're going to see it. Um, can you blast it out with a hose? Likely, especially if you get it right when it happens. But like most of the stuff that we have, it is dark black, and uh, it will make a heck of a contrast on a white driveway. So rinse it off quick. That is good to know. I hope our applicator here was listening to that because he's the one who will have to scrub anything. I've I've done that. Um, I had to scrub iron off a fence for two days with toilet bowl cleaner. Uh, that was my initiation into this company. That's so I don't fine. want to play that again again. Um, that's another thing of John's product line as well for anybody watching that we are big fans of is a lot of the stuff that he has that contains iron. It mixes in really nicely and perks things up beautifully. Um, I've got somebody else asking about the temperature and air rate. Obviously for dethatch because it's all of that chewing up of organic matter, the hotter the better, still works no matter what consideration where aerate is concerned is there any kind of temperature restriction if it's too hot is it going to be any kind of risk the no no that's fine um i'll say this about anything you know when we're dealing with soils you gotta water in I, that that's my suggestion to everything it, it helps to go ahead and push whatever you apply down into the soil so do you have to do that no but will it work faster Yes, you might delay reaction if you don't do that. So for me, I like to get a little extra water down every single time, no matter what I put out. I want to push things down into the soil and I want to start working right away. So I think that's good for everybody to know is, is technically uh, with even like high nitrogenous products, you can put them out when it's super hot as long as you have the water to go with it. If you don't have the water to go with it, you're going to have issues. So it's basically about diluting the material and getting it down. And that's the, what's going to keep any sort of phytotoxicity or, you know, burning, if you don't know what that means, to, to plant tissue. So um, aerate can dry out plants. It can because it's high in potassium. It is an alkaline shock. Um, so if you do put it out, you could see like, oh, this looks a little extra dry. There's your advice. What did I just say? Water it in beforehand. If it can dry it out, then you just should have watered before. It's all you're going to do to fix it is give it a little bit of moisture and bang, you're back in action. Awesome. And kind of on the subject of that react, um, reactiveness, reactivity, whatever the word I'm looking for would be. Um, I had somebody earlier in the chat ask about any kind of interaction or loss of efficacy where fungicides are concerned with next products. If a fungicide is being applied with the next product kind of in one big lump lump application, is that any kind of issue that you've experienced? No, that's not, that's not a problem at all. The, the only time you would ever have issues with it in the tank, uh, fungicide in water alone has a pretty short half-life. 
Um, and if you start mixing it with other fertilizing materials or anything else, that can be shortened even more. So whatever you mix up, you need to spray. Um, if you make a tank of fungicide, it, you know, in the morning of a Monday and you don't spray it till Tuesday, congratulations, you just had a nice walk and nothing else is going to happen. Um, so make sure you use what you make. Definitely. Um, and I also have somebody asking, and this is a question that I saw posed um, on Facebook earlier today as well. I've got a lot of people who are interested in how Aerate interacts with soil systems based on their composition. So do you see any kind of change in the either efficacy or mode of transportation or application rates when it comes to sandy soil like we have terribly in the Richmond area, our average CEC is five, or versus in clay or really rich, nice thick soils um, that are gonna be much higher CEC. I don't know where John went. I think we might have lost John for a second. So since we're going to be waiting on that question, um, does anybody have questions for me and Brandon about Picture Perfect or anything else? We are taking questions in terms of that. Um, right now, for my Picture Perfect clients, I do want to make it extra super duper clear. We're going to be offering um, a reduction in terms of the cost when we're switching from core aeration to liquid aeration. So right now prices are kind of fixed on core aeration based on how much time it takes, the maintenance of the equipment, stuff like that. Because liquid aeration is much more straightforward, it can be applied from our same Z spray machine that we use to apply seed at the same time because it's a spreader sprayer. It ends up saving time. It's not a whole separate piece of equipment that we have to cart out. So it's something that we can give you guys a lower rate on. If you're a current Picture Perfect client and you currently get core aeration with us as part of your program, um, we'll kind of make up the difference in terms of that service. But it's about 20 to 30 back. in terms of that. My Thanks, John. So um, that's, that's all right. battery died. I was coming in here. Oh. Sorry, my battery died. I got in here, restarted everything. That's poor form. You should be Sorry, ashamed of yourself. I should. It's just iPhones. What yeah. do you do? Okay, I did get your question though, so I can answer that. I don't know what you said in the meantime, but I'm sure you did a great. I job. filled it. It's all good. Okay. It's all so, good. Yeah, go go for it. Here's here's the deal. Um, soil composition. I think that is a great question. Sandy soil versus clay soils. Okay, compacted soils. Obviously, this is where you're going to shine the most, right? You're actually going to see some uh, better drainage and things like that. Sandy soils already drain really, really well. The point. There's not really much of a point to aerate inside of a sandy soil anyway, because your particle sizes are so big. Um, what we have seen inside of those areas where it's uh, much lower CEC, typically your higher calcium, you have some of these higher um, minerals that tie things up. We've seen better release of like tied up phosphorus, tied up calcium uh, that actually end up benefiting the overall plant health and dr even driving roots deeper and that's more of what you're going to get in those cases. So obviously, you know, we don't aerate sandy soils. Like there's not really a reason to do that because it doesn't pack together. Uh, so it gets used as a different purpose oftentimes in sandy soils, low CEC soils. And so you kind of have to think of, of a lot of these products, a lot of the next products like a, like a Bob Ross painting. There's a lot of happy accidents that happen. The material can be used for a multitude of items, and it really depends on what you're ultimately going for. So uh, in, in down in Florida, where I am right now, people use aerate a lot, a couple times a year anyway, because there's a lot of phosphorus that's tied in the soil, and there's a lot of calcium that's tied in the soil. And even though the pH is really high, we see a flush of color and we see a flush of growth on the turf and end up just generating greater rooting. And ultimately, that's what we're going for um deeper roots roots die back create more organic matter in the soil and that it ends up catching more minerals and and better use of the feedings that you give it subsequently so that's that's really what you're getting out of that that's awesome um i just want to pause real quick it seems like the battery issue might have affected everybody's ability to see your person um i think they can hear you because nobody is blowing up the chat saying we can't hear john you're just sitting there um but i think that they were watching me watch you that whole time which is just a little funky so i don't know how to fix that can if you I see me am i, I am I, 
Yeah, I can see you. I don't think anybody else can see you because we're watching YouTube on the phone. Um, I don't know how, uh -huh. it, but I think that they can at least hear you. And nobody's saying that they can't hear you. So we can just roll with that until somebody awesome wants to. And there he goes. Are you back? Yeah, I just decided to push a button and see what would happen. <laughs> Did anything change? I don't think anything changed. Uh, it's the same on my end. I don't know. I got a little arrow here. Let's push that. No? Still yeah. I think they can still hear you. Um, I just don't think anybody can see you. So if you want to um, tell us a couple more things. I've got somebody who's asking about how um, aerate affects drainage. So in terms of standing water in the yard or anything like that, that can be attributed to compaction. Um, I know that there are other lawn care YouTubers who have kind of demoed this and done the science experiment and said, wow, look at this. Um, mm -hmm. Is that parlor tricks or is that really something? Uh, that oh, that's true. I mean, that's honestly one of the, out of the emails that I get on either through my channel or through my audience, that's one of the biggest things that people say, like, I used to have standing water and I don't anymore. Um, or, you know, this hill used to dry out, but now the water gets into it. Or, you know, I hear that a lot. And and that's for a few reasons. You know, um, obviously, we're, we're, we're creating an environment that the plant roots want to grow. And nothing does better drainage than those plant roots. So if we can create an environment in which we can go deeper with roots, then we know that water is going to drain better. So that's just from the plant's perspective. But how do you create that mode? And a lot of the time, it's basically we're bringing a shock to the system of the soil. So it's a high, high pH product. It's carrying a significant amount of energy. There is a release that happens when it starts to hit organic matter. And that's really all there is to it. So, no, I mean, we're basically making more plant available water. That's essentially what's happening. That makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Um, and I think somebody asked about a separate product just to, to kind of go ahead step to the side for a second. Um, somebody asked, since we talked about temperature restrictions on Aerate, is there a temperature restriction for, as per application on the Green FX 007 or Microgreen 002? Nope. Put it out. Water okay. it in. Water Put it, it out. Water it in. That sounds good. That definitely works. Um, and I did have somebody else asking, and they got very chemistry technical about it. And I'm much more a geology nerd than a chemistry nerd. Um, but they were mainly asking about how the composition of aerate actually works in terms of that chemical conversion that's taking place in the soil system itself. And without losing viewers with anything way too deep, do you want to try to explain how sure. exactly that happens? I actually think of what, what would be better is to tell the story as to why I came up with it in the first place. That sounds good. Um, so th this is not boring at all. You guys, are, I swear to God, just stick with me here for a second. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> okay, so we, as a company, make a ton of humic acid. We are constantly in production of liquid humate. It is not a soluble powder. It is not, um, it's nothing that we just mix with water and then we use it. That's not how this works. It is a reactive process with shale. And what I need everybody to understand is that shale has already been broken down. The next step in it is coal. Okay, so we're essentially dealing with like a dirty coal, this lignin material that is very old it, the material of humic acid is stored up inside there and it is locked inside there. So if you were to just take the material and spread it, you'll never get the benefit of the actual acids itself because it has not had a way to break free from those other carbon bonds that are in there. So we react this material in a tank with potassium hydroxide. Okay, that's one of the pieces. It's an alkali bath. And it takes a lot of time to make the acids flush up into a solution this is not a suspended product this is a solution so it's a whole material so one day i was sitting there thinking about that reaction and basically we're taking carbon components that used to be living rainforests that have been compressed over millions and millions of of you know years and and now we have this acid that's stuck and we're flushing it up and as i was thinking about this i said well why can't we do that in the soil via the same type of reaction so 
that was the concept is if we shock it enough, we can flush out those same humic acids that come from humus, organic matter, and start to react the soil so that it gets this sort of release into the rest of the soil solution. So that's why it works. So then you'll ask, okay, well, why can't we just go out and put out potassium hydroxide? Well, hey, that's fine if you're looking to melt yourself into a bowl of jelly. It's very dangerous stuff. And uh, if anybody has seen the movie Fight Club, there is a wonderful example of putting that on the guy's skin and pouring water on it and just eating through the flesh of that person. Beautiful movie. Anyway, so, but you need to understand that, that it's so highly reactive that it's looking for these carbon and organic compounds to chew through and release into the soil. So hopefully... It wasn't scientific. It was more of a story, but you understand where I'm going with that. It was a good story, and I I enjoyed the reference because that is a great movie. You're absolutely right. Tyler, Church, let's go. <laughs> um, I think I think we're pretty much covered everything in terms of the questions that I've gotten beforehand. I'm getting people asking about other products of yours, which is great. Um, somebody wants to know what's the difference from humic DG and humic 12 other than the liquid and granular. Is there any difference in terms of that makeup? Between humic DG and humic 12? Yes. Great okay. question. And actually the story I just told fits perfectly into that. Well, I'm just so You have to think that. about it. So I want everybody to understand this. So it's, you can prill linardite shale. Uh, uh, using certain components, you can turn that into a prilled material. The biggest benefit that you're going to get out of it is the soil carbon. If the humic has not released over millions and millions of years, there's a very little chance you're going to get the benefit of it on your lawn at all. So it's, it's not reacted. It's now you're just basically putting carbon out and whatever little mineral components can detach from there. You're, it will work somewhat as a catcher's mitt for other things that you're applying, but you're not going to see really anything. You're just basically adding carbon ash material to your soil at that point because there's nothing to react it out. So you're dealing with basically live versus dead or energy versus no energy, uh, if you want to look at it that way. Because if you look at the application rates and, and go through studies and what, what people are really looking at, you might put out two gallons of a 12% solution per acre and get visual results and soil results where you might have to put out four or 500 pounds of a dry material to get any result whatsoever. So just if you think about that, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, how is, how is something that's 72% humic acid in a granular working less than something that's 12% at a much lower rate? It's because the reactivity already done we've actually made it available to something that can be used by the soil and the plant at a, at a faster rate basically is what you're getting awesome thank you for explaining that um i want to just give this opportunity to anybody who is still in the chat wants to ask a question let's dial it back into liquid aeration in case there's anything still free floating there um if you're a picture perfect client and you have any questions i don't I haven't seen any names of picture perfect clients pop up yet but i want to hear from you guys but i know somebody's watching so just give a shout out it's something you already know the answer to um i know that there's a lot of stuff that john has out there that is awesome so if you haven't already be sure to check out everything to do with this product Check out Oncology, the YouTube channel, because he is talking about stuff all the time. Also, check out RVA Lawn Love. Um, he has done an awesome job from a DIY side of trying new things, checking out the industry, and he's really, really interesting to watch. And he did a great job trying to help us promote this show tonight. So big appreciation to RVA Lawn Love for that. Um, just to summarize, liquid aeration seems like a very strong alternative to core aeration, not simply for the purpose of pulling out plugs of soil like John talked about, but on a much more complex and soil enriching level. It allows the freeing up of space for so many more things than just a hole can offer. Is there anything, John, that you want to kind of close on when it comes to liquid aerate or anything else that you're seeing being a hot topic right now? Yeah, actually, I do. I would say this. You know, the concept of liquid or chemical aeration is not new. And 
like probably many people who are hearing from about for the first time. When I first heard about the concept and then looked into what was being offered, uh, it was garbage. I, mean, I just want to be honest. It was not good. It was, you know, what we're seeing is heavy surfactants being applied. So what's that really going to do? Temporary penetration of the soil for other things to get down to, but very, very temporary. So I think it's important that everybody knows that it's not that mode of action. We're not doing a heavy, uh, you know, non-ionic surfactant. We're not using any of those like soap based materials to do that. That is not the way that this works. Um, so my whole concept with everything we've ever done is we want to have something that the plant can use, something that builds the soil by leaving something else behind. If we can create a space, we want to keep the space. We want to leave something there to hold that space open. So everything we do is adding back in and adding back in every single time we do it. And, and that's really why you get the benefit, especially you know over time more and more. Awesome. Um, I've got a couple of specific questions that have come up in terms of aerate. So that's that's exciting. Um, somebody wants to know in terms of application, it sounds like they prefer to use a backpack sprayer versus sure. a sink and a hose. Is there anything in terms of Aerate or any other next products that that might have a problem with? Put it out, water it in. I'm Put it out, water it in. Put it All out, right. water it in. Get it on the ground. Does it do any good if it's not on the ground? If you leave it in the bottle, it's not going to do anything. I guarantee it. Awesome. And liquid aeration is there such a thing as too much of a good thing in terms of frequency of applications three gonna, four yes. three times a year i am gonna well not maybe not necessarily i think that what most people do is they want to get super excited and just dump a jug out mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna do it spoon it in take your time you know like lawn care is a story it's an adventure you you see it come up. You watch your seed grow. You give birth to a lawn. This is going to sound really terrible. It, it comes up. You're you're nurturing it through its life, and and the reality is, it's way easier to kill things than to keep them alive. So you need to keep that in mind that you're nurturing this landscape. You're nurturing the soil. You want it to come along slowly, steadily, and strong. Okay, so don't overdo it. Take your time. It's fun to work in a lawn. Enjoy it. Don't do it all at once. The worst thing you can do is over apply anything. Um, just that that's the only thing I'll say about it. Is there a way to apply too much? Only at a time, yes. Through yeah. the course of the season, probably not. That definitely makes sense. Um, and is it... I think I think people are kind of cycling back to using aerate with fall overseeding instead of mechanical aeration, like we mm -hmm. talked about. Go for it with them together. That's right. Do it. Yeah, put it out. Absolutely. Awesome. I mean, th there's going to be some pretty cool things coming up. You guys need to just be paying attention over the next few weeks about what's coming for overseeding um, uh, from our end from Green County. And we do recommend that we do recommend the aerate going out and. Um, Air 8, RGS, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're getting some good root stimulating, seed germinating, uh, you know, soil nutritive material that's going along with the fertilization and the seed that goes down. So, yes. Gotcha. And um, I have a picture perfect client that's popped up. So I'm really Yay. excited about that. <laughs> um, she's asked if the process is going to take longer to put down because it has to saturate below the surface and deep down into levels. It just kind of does its thing and soaks in as it needs to. It, yeah. So everything travels with water, right? So it, it really, however water is going to flow, you're going to get greater penetration. It Don't expect the soil to jump out and move into little piles with little holes around it. So you're not going to see that, but you are going to see material flowing better, water flowing better, seed germinating faster. Uh, and in fact, I mean, a lot of people are saying, look, you know, I, I put this out. I also see longer greening. And some people who run it by itself in the middle of summer say, you know, I got a weird green up that happened because of this. And oftentimes just because we're untying minerals, we're, we're releasing things into the plant. And that that's really what it comes down to. Awesome. Technically, there's really very little nutrition in there. There's a little, there's potassium, 
that's not enough to make the jumps that people see. That doesn't make any sense. Like scientifically, it'd be like, that's not enough to do anything. You're right. It's, it's chemical reactions in the soil. That makes sense. That definitely does. Well, I, I really appreciate everything that you've helped us kind of walk through and discuss, John. If there's anything that you have to say to the group, this would be the time. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up. Is there anything that you can think of in terms of that? Um, I would say this. Uh, the folks at Picture Perfect are doing an incredible job. And it's been really fun to see their journey over the last couple of years since I've gotten to know them. And the willingness to try these materials and see what happens and come from a skeptical standpoint into the standing behind that we know that this works. Your lawn is in our hands and it's guaranteed to be good. Like, so you've got to trust your provider. Um, that's, that's all I'm going to say. I appreciate that. We're we're really excited to be able to introduce this as a core aeration alternative to our clients. If you're a Picture Perfect client or anybody else watching and you haven't yet, be sure to go back a couple of weeks ago and check out our video on liquid aeration where we talk about the bullet points of the situations in which it is appropriate versus not because there is still a good argument for core aeration in completely bare areas and we always have a few dozen properties a year that are newly signed up that just don't have an established lawn yet in which case those cores especially on slopes are going to be a great resource to give that seed a foothold if you're a picture perfect client and you have any questions about liquid aeration or anything else anything that john has mentioned here be sure to shoot me an email. You've got my email address, my cell phone number, whatever you need. And if you're a homeowner or a professional applicator and you've got questions that you've been chatting at me that I haven't touched on, you should have John's contact information as well. At the least, go to his Loncology YouTube channel and hit him up there. Lord knows he will answer your questions because he fields our questions on a daily basis and is a great resource to have in your pocket. If there's anything that you have questions about that you want to see us do future live shows about or future videos about just in general, let me know. Always looking for ideas. I appreciate everybody joining us. Say goodbye, Brandon. I will tell, tell John to wait, John. but we can't see him. So know that he's still there and he's smiling. Um, and I hope that you guys all have a great evening. We'll be back in a month for another live show about aeration and seeding Q&As in general. And until then, stay tuned for next week. See you guys later. Bye. Bye.